good afternoon and uh, welcome to our priad 40 discussion on young scientists learning open science um, we have a very stellar panel with us here today um, the program is for 2 hours uh, we will start with a short introduction about priya and our work around community based participatory research and building a knowledge democracy uh, followed by uh, panelists who will speak on uh, different aspects of open science and uh, we have two uh, question and answer sessions from the audience uh, and if you have any questions please feel free to raise them either in the chat box or in the q and a uh function as part of the zoom which you will find at towards the bottom of your screen so um i'm going to begin with a short presentation about priya so welcome everyone um priya at 40 has been a very exciting journey for us and we are pleased to share our journey with you uh, through a series of webinars which we've been holding uh, over the past few months. Um, the, we call ourselves educators, facilitators, uh, a support organization. Our support is not just as um, you know, an organization that gives uh, financial help, but we give support through information, awareness, in particular, sharing our knowledge, uh, sharing, uh, systematizing knowledge and sharing it with others and linkage building support through mediation expertise. But we also provide emotional support to those who are our partners and friends. Uh, Priya has a very unique uh, theory of change, uh, which we act as a bridge between uh, the supply, what we call the supply and demand side. The demand side is um, <clears throat> citizens, particularly the marginalized and the excluded through awareness generation, information sharing, knowledge mobilization, uh, they are collectivized. And then we work with the supply side, which is sensitizing uh, governance institution, private agencies, increasingly academic institutions, uh, to share their knowledge and uh, work with citizens so that we may have sustainable development for all. We engage with as many uh, stakeholders as possible to put in place answers which are long lasting and effective. Uh, and uh, we also uh, support uh, organizations to share their knowledge uh, with citizens so that we may have sustainable development for all. Uh, we've been working for the past 40 years, as you know, and we started in the 1980s. Uh, in the 1980s, our work was uh, around uh, making available and making uh, spreading uh, the awareness about participatory research as a separate methodology. Uh, there was right to learn in the, in the 1980s. We moved on to the right to know in the 1990s. In 2000s, our work was more around the right to information, and in the past decade or so, we've been talking about the right to participation. We've been using our participatory research methods and approaches across various thematic areas, which you can see on the screen. These include citizen participation, making the gender leap, empowering civil society, decentralizing governance to make it community-based, uh, ensuring a sustainable future for our cities, and of course, building a knowledge democracy. Participatory research, as you know, is very much in our name. And so it is a, a very important and central part of the work that we do. Um, we began in the 1980s, as I mentioned, by using it to systematize indigenous local and experiential knowledge. We did this around the work around uh, forest and forest dwellers. Uh, we worked with displaced families uh, who were being displaced due to, bank, due to dams that were being built. Uh, we worked with workers around issues of occupational health and safety and with rural poor women around issues of their livelihood. Uh, 
participatory research became the basis of formulating our pioneering participatory training methodology through which we have trained numerous field facilitators to work with communities and use this approach. Uh, we have used it to develop participatory assessment of organizations, which we call the organizational development framework, participatory assessment, and participatory evaluation techniques and methods. Uh, towards the uh, second decade of our work and in the third decade of our work, we particularly engaged with universities and institutions of higher education to change the culture of knowledge generation in academia. Uh, in particular, we have focused on building capacities around community-based participatory researchers among new generation researchers. Uh, it was in 2012 that this work was recognized through the UNESCO Chair in Community-Based Research and Social Responsibility in Higher Education. This is a unique chair in that it is held by two co-chairs uh, Professor Bud Hall at the University of Victoria in Canada and Dr. Rajesh Tandon here in Priya. And uh, it's a unique chair in the sense of it's a partnership between academia and a civil society organization. And the Knowledge for Change Consortium or the K4C Consortium uh, takes forward this work of building engagement with community and through community university research partnerships. In the past three or four years, especially with the Ring project, and uh, we have been involved in building an ecosystem for responsible research and innovation. And this includes scientific research used for society and with society to help society. And in the past couple of years, we held several open science dialogues uh, where we brought in perspectives of multiple epistemologies into policy recommendations. And uh, we are happy that uh, the UNESCO has recently adopted, in fact, just last week, uh, their open science recommendations in which several of the um, uh, recommendations made by the UNESCO chair have found a place. Today's uh, webinar focuses on young scientists learning open science. Uh, the primary uh, objective of today's discussion is to understand how multi-stakeholder partnerships can be built to nurture scientific research so that locally led knowledge is used by science for science to serve society and how science can become open, transparent and accountable. Uh, in this, we will hear sp perspectives from various panelists on what is responsible research and innovation, uh, public engagement, science communication, how can we include multiple uh, sources of knowledge into scientific research, and the ethical issues surrounding uh, this, uh, surrounding the openness of science. Um, with that, I conclude my presentation. And I now invite Dr. Akhilesh Gupta, uh, Additional Secretary at the Department of uh, Science and Technology in the Government of India, uh, to give us some opening remarks. Dr. Gupta. Thank you. Uh, uh, in fact, let me begin with thanking Priya for uh, inviting me to, uh, to share my thoughts on the open science i think as you know so very good afternoon and good morning to all the participants attending from different parts of the world uh, as you know the uh, open science is recognized as an umbrella term for uh, enabling efficient uh, pathways for scientific knowledge creation uh, diffusion quality control cooperation uh, using digital technology and other collaborative tools. And this is helping uh, the, uh, to expand the societal impact of science in response to the growing and complex global issues, uh, including the environmental issues like climate change. And, and this is one of the biggest tools for democratization of science and, uh, and now being pursued uh, by most of the countries across the world. 
Now in India, in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, the government of science and technology and biotechnology have adopted open access framework way back in 2014, but uh, that has had very really limited success. Uh, of late, you know, the, the Office of Principal Scientific Advisor to Government of India and the Government of Science and Technology uh, took up an initiative to formulate a national science and technology innovation policy. And uh, the open science framework uh, was one of the uh, components of this new policy draft that has been uh, submitted to government for finalization. And these, uh, the framework that we had in check submitted is largely in line with the recent UNESCO Open Science Recommendation adopted by the member countries. There are two essential pillars of this framework. One is, of course, enhance availability of open data from publicly funded research. And the second part is open access. Uh, the <clears throat> in addition, the framework has uh, uh, several components. For example, it has uh, included significance of sharing of research uh, facilities, improvement of quality of Indian journal, enhanced access to libraries, including digital libraries, open open learning spaces, open educational materials, and digital infrastructure. Uh, fundamentally, the framework proposes a better integration of science and society and recognition of traditional knowledge systems and more uh, equitable participation of various stakeholders. Uh, the importance of science communication and citizen science has also been acknowledged as part of this uh, you know, framework. Now, there are issues uh, that uh, are actually included as part of this, uh, the two important things, two important components as part of the open access are the following. One is the one nation, one subscription model uh, of you know, negotiating centrally with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, you know, the major publishers and to bring uh, access to everyone in the country. Uh, currently, only a few thousands of people have access uh, to, uh, to these journals. Also, uh, this creates uh, democratization where everybody gets access to this thing. Second, of course, is the article processing charges, APC, and uh, there we're still debating uh, whether this suits uh, us in terms of uh, growth financially and, and and also social economic The uh, another thing, a major thing that is included as part of this is the STI, National STI Observatory, which has uh, several components that please include the knowledge and data repository, computational grid, virtual communication and interaction and virtual access of equipment, laboratories, uh, also conducting analysis of projects, uh, funding and outcome, and uh, also evaluation and accreditation and ranking of uh, different technology, uh, different uh, protocols for the benchmarking. Uh, I would uh, conclude by saying that achieving the goals of uh, open access and open, open science both need a massive change of culture. We, uh, so India is in fact catching up with this and we are in fact uh, trying to uh, create an ecosystem where we align national priorities with the global call uh, and try to, uh, you know, implement this open access in the country in a, in a more holistic and institutional way. This will require a lot of work at our end to manage the entire policy that also has been successful. Both as in fact have helped in the economic system. We create a new and a 
and also the uh, the kind of uh, in terms of vaccine and other issues was made available. And this is a good example of how the world got united uh, to share more and more things. And there is one issue that in fact uh, we would uh, uh, also contemplating in India is that the open access in humanity and social science research. So this field, uh, many, uh, we know that in this area, the uh, research papers are not uh, 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 in in number and and the mostly in the the knowledge and data are available in terms of books and gray literature, and so there are initiatives that need to be taken to help sharing of uh, the open uh, access to books. Last point is that you know we have uh, India has having several issues on the uh, translated uh, you know literature. We have a large number of regional languages, and the the, the open access will be uh, will not be complete if we don't share the, the scientific literature in uh, in the regional language. So we have started an initiative called uh, the National Translation Mission has been launched recently, and also DSP has taken up a separate initiative on uh, you know creating a wikipedia in regional languages so i think this will uh, this these are the these initiatives are towards providing uh, uh, you know open science uh, and open access to the uh, the, the scientists uh, at large in uh, working in different diverse areas yeah, thank you very much i'm sorry i've taken a little more time thank you not at all thank you dr gupta for uh, sharing with us how the DST is promoting open science. In particular, uh, it's interesting that you said there should be a change of culture. And that is certainly something that development of an ecosystem and multiple stakeholders working together can help uh, build and achieve. Um, I would now like to invite Professor Andrew Adams from Meiji University. Professor Adams will uh, share with us uh, specific recommendations around ethics and public engagement and inclusion of multiple sources of knowledge from the UNESCO recommendations on science and scientific researchers. Uh, Dr. Adams. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I've had the, uh, the privilege of working alongside people from PRIA uh, in the uh, RING project um, for the last few years. And what I'm presenting today is very much one of the outputs, one of the many, many outputs that uh, Priya and Major University and all our other partners in the, uh, uh, the Ring uh, EU Horizon 2020 project have uh, produced. So I'm going to be focusing very much here on the RSSR. This is the uh, UNESCO recommendation on science and scientific researchers, um, and in particular, the aspects of ethics and public consultation, a little bit of mention of the uh, inclusion of indigenous knowledge, although I believe we have a, another speaker later who's going to address that, uh, that question in more depth. So I'm just going to briefly introduce the RSSR to you for those who may not actually know what it is in detail. Um, and I'll give two major parts of my presentation. First, I'll look at the implications for science and research ethics in the RSSR, and then on the requirements for public consultation in the RSSR. So the RSSR, UNESCO Recommendation on Science and Scientific Research, um, the name makes you think it's some whiffly piece of uh, uh, um, diplomatic uh, language that has been uh, agreed without any teeth. Now, this isn't quite true. Um, it is actually an international human rights treaty. Um, it has been signed at the UN by the vast majority of nations around the world. It's an international human rights treaty and therefore it does have quite a high status diplomatically. Its legal status is unfortunately not as strong as those of us who are very interested in um, open science and related matters. It's not as strong as we'd like. Um, 
These sorts of treaties are notoriously hard to enforce in authoritarian countries. Um, they're also actually quite hard to enforce in countries where you have weak constitutional arrangements. Now, as you have noticed from my bio, I'm currently based in Tokyo, although as you look at me, you'll realize I'm not a native um, of this country. I'm actually British. Um, and I have to admit that uh, the UK is one of those countries in which these sorts of treaties can be hard to uh, enforce. In some other countries, though, they may be legally enforceable. Um, it, it just depends on how strong the uh, constitutional arrangements are that these treaties are embedded with. But that's not to be completely pessimistic about this. This is a very strong statement by the international community about how science needs to work with and for society and to improve its own engagement in a better way so that the results of science don't only benefit the scientists themselves and the or the countries in which they live or the people who are uh, funding the particular research, but to broaden out um, both the sources of information that we use in science, but also open out the results of that science. In general, its biggest power will probably be the soft power. And the local and institutional aspe aspect, the impact on your local and your institutions may be much greater than that at the nat national level. So when you are talking about your own internal policies at your research institute or your university or your commercial research lab, this is a very useful treaty to have sitting there when you are arguing about what your policies should be. It won't be a trump card that you can play to get everything perfect, but it is a very strong way that you can say, look, we should be doing this. This is part of the RSSR. Um, and if we don't do it, we may end up being forced to do it. So why not do it ahead of time without being forced and get ourselves in line with these ideas? So what does this mean? Well, the RSSR is quite a large document. Um, so I'm just going to focus on these two major aspects of it. The first one is the question of ethics. Now, scientific ethics, um, in particular medical ethics, but also ethics in various other aspects of science, has been broadly discussed for at least 80 years now. The, the aftermath of the Second World War in particular saw an immense um, interest in improving the ethics. But this has mostly been focused on the conduct of research. And even up till now, when you talk to people in a research institution about what um, research ethics means, the first reaction is always, well, it's about doing science in an ethical way. But the, and the RSSR does include that. It includes very strong recommendations on the ethical ways to conduct your science. And in particular, looking at the impact on your, um, uh, on your subjects, if you're in an area which uses human subjects. But it also includes a focus on the intent and the impact of your research on not just the researcher themselves, but on society, on individuals in those societies uh, and on the environment. It also stresses very strongly that ethical responsibilities are not the sole concern of the individual researcher. That again is something that came out during the late 20th century as the, as the, the um, most of the understanding of, of uh, science ethics was focused down on the conduct of the individual researcher. And that's all very well for the conduct of research, although it does give problems, particularly for junior researchers, if a senior researcher is less than ethical in their approaches sometimes. Um, but this uh, recommendation, this treaty, stresses very strongly that it is institutions from governments, through funding agencies, through regulators, down to universities, research labs, and commercial research organizations, that they have increased ethical expectations in this modern era. And that those expectations are not just about the conduct of the individual research, they are about the research environment um, that they create, they are about equality of access to the right to do research and to the results of that research, and also requiring uh, researchers and research institutions to think through the impact of the work they're going to do. It also adds very strongly the fact that in the ethics sphere, 
acknowledgement, inclusion and recommendation uh, and recognition of indigenous knowledge contributions are a key ethical requirement. So if you're bringing in um, indigenous knowledge or if you have an area where you can bring in indigenous knowledge, you are supposed to do so and you are supposed to acknowledge the contribution of that and ensure that the benefits of that knowledge go back to the community from which you gained it. One of the ways in which this ethical agenda is carried out is by increasing the requirements for public consultation. Now, as I say, one of the other areas about ethics that was previously rather under uh, explored and under stressed was the impact of research, but also looking at how you decide which research to do. That's a major public ethical question. And we need greater public consultation on the research agenda, on all of the different elements, on the goals of the research. What are we going to fund as public funders? Um, the public should have a direct say in that. They shouldn't be the ones who have a veto. They shouldn't be the ones deciding precise goals of research um, themes, but they should have a say, particularly when money is always limited. Um, there are going to be choices about which types of project get funded, which not. The public should have a say in the broad goals. They should also be able to understand the methods that are used and be able to express uh, misgivings about certain approaches and certain methods. Um, so the priorities of public research funding and the regulation of public research funding. On the research practice, we can no longer just say, well, we have these codes of conduct and everyone sits, um, abides by them. We need to be talking to the public about what our progress is during the uh, projects as we can. Um, now, science often isn't really amenable to being too heavily um, explained during the process, but we need to do better at doing that. Where it can be, we should be expressing what, what's going on and how we're doing it. The conduct of research ethics, um, we need public engagement in the setting and enforcing of these regulations. And finally, on the research outcomes, um, as Dr. Gupta has already talked about today, there is a strong push now worldwide to open access to the uh, specific written versions, but also open the data that we generate during projects and allow access to the raw and process data that underpin those um, projects and those papers that are published. But we also need to work on not just talking to other scientists and other researchers, we need to talk to the public as well. Now, not every scientist is going to be good at that, but many can be if they're given the right training and the right access to um, help and materials. And those who can't, they need to accept that, but they then need to work with those who can do that. And we need to do things like recognize the uh, uh, activity of those who specialize in the public understanding of science and recognize them as co-equals in the development of public and open science. Okay, so I've kept to 10 minutes. I hope that's uh, what you were expecting. Um, so I hope that set the scene for you about how the RSSR um, can help in these specific areas. It's a much bigger document. It, it uh, impacts on all the bits um, that people are talking about today. Um, and I do encourage you to read it. It's a little long, but it's not ridiculously long and it's worth knowing what's in it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Andrew, for sharing your uh, experience of reading the RSSR document. Um, the, the impact of research on society, that's what stands out to me because that is also part of the community-based participatory research approach that uh, we are so interested and concerned with, uh, which research to do and how community has a voice in understanding research and its impact is a very important uh, aspect of being open. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bolton, uh, who will share with us key messages from the UNESCO recommendation on open science, just recently adopted last week by UNESCO. Uh, Dr. Bolton. So my purpose isn't quite um, as described by Sumitra, but uh, uh, hopefully it's, um, it'll, it'll converge with it. Um, my real purpose is to set the UNESCO recommendations um, in the context of evolving ideas about open science 
uh, from very much from the perspective of the International Science Council, which has been the, in one form or another, the global voice for science for over a hundred over a hundred years. The the vision of the um, uh, Science Council uh, is of science as a global public good, uh, and we start with a series of assertions that knowledge is the most powerful of public goods, that science is a special form of knowledge, and I will come back to that, and that we require not only science for our contemporary problems, which are large, uh, as Dr. Gupta has described, but also we need science for the future. The future, of course, is uh, inherently unpredictable. Um, science for the present is largely driven in nation states by uh, national priorities funded by the research councils, and the role of the universities in science for the future has been crucial. Uh, under the aegis of um, the concept of academic freedom, they're free to choose what to research, they're free to choose how to research it, and to a large extent they're funded to do that. If one, one only needs to look at the COVID experience to realize how much we have benefited from non-directed research in a wide variety of domains that have turned out to be of enormous value to, to the response, national and international responses to COVID. If we look back over the last um, 70 or 80 years, there's been an evolving implicit social contract for science. In the years immediately following the Second World War, the general national productions were the best means of creating innovation for public benefit from science was simply to let scientists get on with it in, in, in a competitive environment. Uh, as the years went by, the awareness that most of the major problems that we uh, deal with are inherently complex and therefore inherently interdisciplinary. And as a consequence, the science systems evolved better to be able to cope with major interdisciplinary and complex issues, though we still have a great deal to learn. Uh, and in the recent decades, last two or three decades, the idea that so science must be open to society, transparent and participative, have really taken uh, taken root in science experience. So I've said science is a special form of knowledge. What do I mean by that? And I would say there is a specific ethic, scientific ethic, ethic, which is has two parts. First of all, that knowledge claims, truth claims, if you like, must be accompanied by the evidence on which they're based. So they can be tested against reality and logic by the scrutiny of peers. And secondly, that results of scientific inquiry must be circulated to max in ways that maximize their availability to all who may wish or need to access them. And if that ethic is not central to a new era of open science, then open science will have no value. One of the things that those who do science understand very well, but it's rarely understood beyond, is that the words science and scientific are profoundly misused. They're used to imply correct, certain, proven, and that's what we teach at schools, unfortunately. But unfortunately, science is much more about uncertainty. Science can invalidate, but it can't validate, it can't prove. I mean, to quote Albert Einstein, a thousand experiments cannot prove me right. One experiment can prove me wrong. Now, you might note that contrasts with the certainties of politics, the certainties of religion, and all our certainties when we meet in the bar after work. Unfortunately, this uncertain science has proven to be the best route we have to reliable knowledge. Next slide, please. It's also important to say that open science is not new. Arguably, open science began in the 18th century with the publication of the first available scientific journals, which also required that authors must publish the evidence for the truth claims that they make. Arguably, that has been the bedrock on which the scientific advances of the last 300 years have been built. After 1900 or so, when we saw this enormous growth in capacity of digital processes, the digital revolution has become a great enabler, both for science and to change the face of open science. Um, I quote here um, 
around about the year 2000, 2002, as it happens, the Budapest uh, Declaration, uh, which argues that uh, we now have technologically a capacity to exploit the willingness of science to make the results freely open in order to give scientific literature, scientific understanding, scientific, the scientific record, openly access to all who wish or, or, or need to use it. Uh, and over the last two decades, the scientific community has spent an enormous amount of time and effort in developing ways in which this can be achieved. And then in 2021, we have the UNESCO, this year that is, we have the UNESCO recommendation on open science. Now, the UNESCO recommendation says nothing that hasn't already been developed, worked upon and implemented within the scientific community. What's important about the UNESCO recommendation is that UNESCO has seeded in, in um, bringing together its 193 nation states on the, uh, with the agreement that open science is a new era of science which should be driven forward uh, insofar as it can be done well. So what's next? What, what, what's going to happen next? Next slide, please. Uh, one possibility is that 193 uh, signatory governments or a proportion of them might decide to prescribe how a new regime of open science might be implemented within their, within their territory. Uh, in my view, if that were to happen, then we would, we would have produced a dystopia which would inhibit the, both the rigor of science on the one hand and its creativity on the other. What is crucial is that the scientific community, which has been working in this domain uh, with some energy and enthusiasm over the last few decades, should engage with governments in a creative way to develop a, a crucial element in this enterprise. And that is represented by those two letters in bold, words in bold in the middle, science and society. Uh, having science engage effectively with society is a non-trivial task. It's one that Sumitra has exposed, uh, or, or where she's exposed a series of mechanisms that work in the Indian and other settings. A crucial issue and a, a crucial problem for us all. Next slide, please. So what's the International Science Council doing? Uh, well, first of all, we created earlier this year a series of principles for the record of science. And by the record of science, I mean scientific knowledge has accumulated since the beginning of the scientific enterprise um, uh, two or three thousand two or three thousand years ago which is represented in books in papers in videos increasingly in digital objects in an enormous diversity of forms in a new digital era how well do we currently observe those principles and i'm afraid the answer is not well at all um, we do not have affordable, universal, open access. I work a lot in Africa, and the situation Africa, for, for Africa is, is serious and damaging. Uh, we do not have open access to the record of science. Much of it is contained between, between high pay, pay, paywalls maintained by private companies. Uh, peer review is foundering under pressure. Um, we do not observe the strictures of the early scientific journals of publishing both the truth claims and the evidence, uh, something that's been um, reflected in the uh, replication crisis of, of recent decades. Uh, we don't respect the needs of disciplines and regions effect effectively. Um, we have not exploited the digital revolution as many other sectors have. All we do is transfer from ways of doing things in print to ways of doing things digitally, but basically the same systems. And finally, it's crucially important that this way of doing science is accountable to the scientific community. Um, what I mean by that, I'll come on to in a moment. Next slide, please. So I want to give you a further example of something that the, that the International Science Council has been doing to, in a sense, reflect how we might do this on the ground. On the 1st of January next year, the African Open Science Platform will be launched, uh, operationally launched. We have been attempting to stimulate the development, the creation and development of open science platforms in a number of regions. Africa is implementing very shortly. Its purpose is given by the sentence at the bottom to coordinate, to convene the interests, ideas, people, institutions and resources for open science in and for Africa. Its purpose is shown 
really with and the left hand of these slides and that is it's about engagement engagement between scientists engagement with the public and engagement deeply in education where it's seriously needed but in order to do that we need a whole series of infrastructural elements to be in place which are represented by those the, those three bo other boxes we have a great opportunity and a great challenge but there are some major problems that we have to address first of all the deficit that my deficits that my last slide showed have to be corrected um, we have to develop an open science that also understands that without its rigor and without its creativity science has little value and the danger is that we concentrate on the broader social dimension to the exclusion of these core ethics what we must do is carry them both forward together and if we can do that then we will have created something which in a sense is a, is a, a shift for science beyond the walls and the doors of the laboratories and libraries to make science a public rather than a private enterprise thanks finished <laughs> thank you jeffrey for the very stimulating presentation i particularly liked uh, your opening remark where knowledge is the most powerful public good and as a knowledge institution uh, priya particularly promotes uh, open access and open forms of knowledge accessible to everyone. Uh, open science platforms, that's another interesting uh, area of work, and we will later on hear from another panelist about work being done in that area in India. Uh, I would like to remind our participants, if you have any questions, comments, please do use the chat function and the Q&A function. Um, we will now move on to the next part of our discussion this afternoon. And um, interestingly, our next uh, speaker will speak about open communication of science in the context of the science, technology, and innovation policy of the Government of India. Uh, Dr. Jenis Govias is a DST STI postdoctoral policy fellow uh, at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Dr. Janis. Hello, everybody. Um, you know, it's a great evening to discuss the topics of open science and uh, talking about how communication of science can become more open. I think uh, it's, uh, ve it's very important to note how uh, very clearly uh, we are talking about not just science communication in its little sense that we have defined what science communication is all about, but lastly, communication of science. And uh, in the first part of the five minutes that I have, I would be largely looking at how the science, technology, and innovation policy of India that, is, that will be launched very soon uh, looks to opening up uh, the science communication in itself. Uh, we start uh, this, uh, you know, understanding this policy document. It is uh, it's very important to note that this is the first time in the history of uh, Indian science ecosystem that we have a policy document which has two chapters, one exclusively for open science, the other one exclusively for science communication and public engagement. I'm looking at the chapter on science communication and public engagement, which starts with Article 51 AH of the Indian Constitution, which says it's the duty, it's the fundamental duty of every citizen to develop a scientific, to develop scientific temper, humanism, and a spirit of inquiry and reform. And uh, why am I highlighting it's the duty of every citizen? Because when we look at science communication largely, we talk about the duty only of scientists, but largely it is the duty of every citizen and science need not necessarily come from scientists. And this I think is the first step when we look at opening science communication. While looking at the policy document, the STIP process, which is a science technology innovation policy, looks at opening science communication largely from four angles. First one is building capacity. How do we build capacity, you know, by dialogue, by knowledge transfer, and this knowledge transfer has to happen as a two way process between the stakeholders and the stakeholders could be anybody who is part of the ecosystem of science. Uh, we look at, uh, you know, creative and cross disciplinary platforms and most importantly, these platforms which are explored for capacity building should be accessible to all. 
and capacity building in science communication or in communication of science uh, is required at all levels and i believe it should start right from school level uh, you know developing skill sets in in students uh, training them to impart whatever they have studied in their schools and innovative ways by which these uh, children start understanding the need to communicate science and this will be uh, you know a, a solution to the larger problem of misinformation and disinformation uh, we look at intertwining science engagement and science pedagogy at different stages of academic training in the policy and starting right from the primary school level a uh, capacity building programs uh, you know uh, aim at also at providing accessible infrastructure and databases because without access to database uh, uh, capacity building in science communication again uh, is is a challenge. So the problem of access needs to be uh, solved in order to also look at science communication in in the true sense. Very importantly, for a country as diverse as India and having a local and hyperlocal context very different for different regions of India, it is necessary to look at communication of science in regional languages and looking understanding what the local context is. Uh, so several uh, you know community centric programs are encouraged in this policy document and regional science centers are largely you know being promoted uh, looking at uh, science communication as an interaction between science and society again promoting several citizen science projects which need to uh, to be increased in leaps and bounds looking at the size and the diversity of india and several issues that can be taken up through citizen science and citizen science is one example where we have the reciprocal relationship between science and society where not just scientists communicate to uh, you know the public but also the public contributes back into the sti ecosystem several popular science projects have been encouraged and not just uh, you know uh, the interaction between scientists but also between scientists and whom we call as those who study science around it or who basically study science or in uh, you know the, the typical sense who we say social scientists so the interaction between scientists and social scientists is something that's also being looked at and this dialogue we believe is essential because they study what is science and scientists do science so understanding this context uh, is something that has been highlighted in this policy interaction between ngos civil society groups politicians industry etc the second aspect after capacity building is doing research on science communication, which is essential to open up and understand the problems, you know, uh, kind, kind of uh, impart critical thinking, countering misinformation, promoting scientific temper, evidence-based science communication. And what is very essential is the engagement between various stakeholders in order to address the barriers that the science communication society currently faces. Uh, you know, research on science communication is, is essential. From there on, we move to mainstreaming science communication, promoting it as a full-time career among several people. Today, we have uh, different roadblocks that are there to science communication and, and the common joke that is required. What is required to be a good science communicator if it is asked? The, the common joke is that you require a, a rich spouse because only then it is possible to do good science communication in, in India at present. But promoting it as a lucrative career is something that also the policy looks at. Enabling uh, you know, usage of co covering scientific topics in the mainstream media is something that the policy looks at. It also looks at uh, using entertainment platforms, digital technologies, and several innovative methods of uh, promoting science communication. When we talk of entertainment platforms, I believe uh, to address the regional issues, to address local and hyper-local context, uh, usage of uh, radio, folk arts, and you know, the community radio, again, is a very strong medium when we talk about access because that is something that reaches uh, the last mile. And the community radio is something that has been explicitly mentioned as a tool for uh, opening up of science communication. And the fourth dimension, uh, you know, if I, I should look at, is the outreach that is necessary. And uh, scientists being uh, made to realize that, uh, or, or the scientific institutions made to be realized that the outreach angle is equally important. And this would be in line with the new guidelines that uh, you know we are looking forward to being uh, released as the scientific social responsibility. As part of each one scientific social responsibility, the outreach is essential. So if I should you know just put it all together in just four words, it is capacity building, research on science communication, mainstreaming science communication, 
and outreach. Uh, understanding what individual scientists can do uh, to you know, uh, open up science is, uh, I can look at it in four dimensions. Again, very simple, you know, we require interaction, communication of science, not just between scientists and the public. This is something that is being addressed today. But we also look at the next dimension that is among scientists of different domains. We need to have, you know, several, uh, there, there needs to be several dialogues and knowledge transfer. The third dimension is between scientists and policymakers, something that we are looking at largely promoting as part of the science advice mechanism, or what we call as participatory science advice. And the fourth dimension, which today is largely lacking in India, which is the interaction between scientists and politicians, which, would, which, we, which we could look at as you know, science advocacy. So these are the four dimensions that we could use and we need to use in order to have holistic uh, science communication and opening up science, uh, the communication of science uh, in, in order to make it really fruitful, in order to add it as a pillar of open science. Yeah, these are my few thoughts uh, for the five minutes I have. Uh, over to you, Sumit. Thank you, Janice. And there's a, there's a quick question for you. And if you, uh, you know, want to answer this now or think about it and we can answer it later. Uh, Jeffrey is asking, how do we persuade academics to communicate and reach out when the institutional incentives focus largely or exclusively on publishing scientific papers? So if you uh, would you like to take this question now? Yes, in just one sentence, I think it is, uh, we, we need to change the way we evaluate our academicians. And that is, you know, that is the basis of the entire problem when we talk about open science, whether it's to do with impact factor problem or whether it's to do with the publish and perish, uh, you know, uh, the, the trend that's going on today. I think uh, that the change needs to come in the way we are uh, assessing our academicians. And if they are assessed based on uh, you know, the programs that they do to promote science, I I'm sure there will be a shift in their focus because that's what they are looking at largely. Thank you, Janice. And thank you for the strong emphasis on communication and sharing with us how the new uh, science technology and innovation policy of the government is looking to open up uh, science. I particularly liked your, uh, you know, the, the pillar of capacity building, and building relationships and, you know, the, the role of civil society in actually uh, being part of the communication of science. And uh, the citizen science component of the policy is also an interesting aspect. It's uh, perhaps uh, a new sort of policy focus in India. But our next speaker, uh, Dr. Henk Mulder, will uh, share with us the experience of the science shops in Europe, uh, which has uh, been very, very uh, done interesting work in building this linkage between science and society. Dr. Mulder? Okay, so thank you for inviting me. Good afternoon to everybody. It's uh, noon here in the Netherlands. And my name is Henk Mulder. And, uh, I was asked to say something about science shops, but put them in the uh, context of responsible research and innovation. And responsible research and innovation is a term used by the European Commission uh, to indicate that we should develop uh, innovations that reflect both societal views and their, social and their needs. And of course, that's a very important element if you talk about open science and uh, many speakers address various elements of open science, but I think this, neatly summarizes the, the goal and because I, we're speaking with uh, young scientists at the moment and sometimes you may have the impression that the university are developing all the knowledge they do a lot of research they educate students and maybe all the students would become academics so the idea is that we have all the knowledge and maybe we can share this by traditional forms of science communication to, uh, to the larger society so this is a very traditional way of thinking and I think in fact the model is more like this there's knowledge everywhere and it's maybe different types of knowledge and of course we at university contribute to this knowledge, knowledge development but it's also important for our students to learn from the broader knowledge base that is out there and the term citizen science was already mentioned and I think there's many things that uh, people can contribute to the development of scientific knowledge they apply things in practice, they have skills, they have experience, or you can even call this indigenous knowledge, uh, they have time available. So this is more like the traditional way of doing citizen science, citizens that contribute to data collection or data analysis. But this circle is not complete. If people have no 
uh, way of putting things on the agenda. So like uh, Andrew Adams already said, people should have a say in the topics of the research, the agendas. And this is exactly where the sign shops uh, are one of the good ways to do that. There's multiple ways, but sign shops are one of them. And uh, so in this way, you can co-create co knowledge. So a sign shop, uh, I won't, uh, don't have time to explain where the word comes from, but it's uh, a unit that provides independent and participatory research support in response to concerns expressed by civil society. So we're demand driven. This is a very uh, distinctive element in, in the way that we do science communication. Well, the science shops usually do research for the nonprofit sector, for civil society organizations, citizen groups, etc. And we can do this because the, most of the research is done by students who get course credits and they're supervised by staff to do this. And this is the only way that we can manage to do research uh, for, for free because, well, students are obliged to get course credits anyway. Staff is obliged to supervise them anyway. So that's already in the higher education funding system. There's only some some very limited additional costs for people like me and my colleagues to uh, to manage the whole process. Um, uh, I think I should remove this. Um, anyway, um, so we can do this at free, free or low cost, and this is a very good form of uh, of interactive science communication. So my university in Groningen, uh, well, we're an old university, over 400 years old. We're a classical university. We're pretty large and we are a top 100 university. Uh, but at the same time, we also operate six different science shops in different faculties and we collaborate with our green office. And we have approximately 200 projects a year and uh, over 800 students are involved, and this is about 12% of any cohort uh, every year. We also work together with the science shop of the University of Applied Sciences. Well, because this, this uh, seminar focuses on young scientists, uh, I will give you one example from the science and engineering field, how you can do this. Uh, we were asked by residents in our province uh, who have who are uh, faced with uh, noise from wind turbines during the night. And our country is moving to green energy. There's lots of wind turbines built, but we are very densely populated, so there can be a lot of noise. And especially during the night, there were problems. People complained about this, but the government said, well, according to our computer models, there cannot be any noise at night. Um, so they were a bit desperate, these inhabitants, uh, the residents, and they approached our faculty, and we decided to look into this problem. And what in fact we did, we listened to their problems and we translated it into scientific terms. So this is like reverse science communication. Uh, we did lots of projects with students. There were papers published in, in peer reviewed uh, journals. And in the end, there was even a PhD thesis made out, out of this. So all business as usual for the university, papers, uh, student projects, uh, PhD thesis. And what we found out is that the official government model was suitable for turbines of like 30 or 60 meters high, but not for the new ones that were over 100 meters high, because at that, during the night, there's less wind than the model predicts at that altitude, or there's more wind, I'm sorry. So the turbines turn faster than predicted, and at the same time, at ground level, there's less wind and there's no background noise masking the noise from the turbines. So after five years, the government took our improvements to the model and included them in the new legal national model that they had always used and that commercial consultants had been using without questioning the content. So it really took scientists to open this black box of the model. Um, so if people would not have had a place to go with this issue, this new knowledge would not have been developed. And at the same time, it's still a political decision how much noise is allowed, so we, we don't uh, say anything about that as being the engineers that we are, but at least the policymakers now know that if if they think 40 decibels is acceptable, the turbine should be 600 meters away and not 300 meters. Well, this science shop is not only uh, practice at uh, at, the, at Groningen University, but it's spread throughout the world and it goes by various names, as you can see here, and it's spreading out through many countries, 
with the active support from the European Commission. So they actually gave us a lot of money to, to network. And we built a big organization called Living Knowledge. And this uh, organization, the Living Knowledge Network, is organizing biannual conferences. And the next one will be in my city, in Groningen. And you're all welcome to come and learn much more about uh, what we are doing. And uh, so I hope uh, to see some of you in Groningen. Uh, so that was my presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mulder. And uh, I, this is an interesting uh, aspect that you have raised for us, which is reverse science communication, where you take the concerns of citizens and then you uh, put it in scientific knowledge for scientists. That's something new to me. Uh, I just was wondering, uh, how, do, how do the citizens actually know that there is a science shop and then they can go to a university? How has that been institutionalized? So we exist for 40 years, and uh, so we're well known with the larger NGOs and the municipalities and bureaus for legal aid, and we actively approach the larger organizations as well, so patient associations or larger environmental federations. And whenever people have problems, they usually approach first their neighbor, then they approach like maybe Friends of the Earth, and they would know about science shops, or they just Google it. They find that we've done similar projects, or they just call the university, and the telephone operator knows any difficult question, just connect people to the science shop. Okay, so that, that, that shows a, a connection between the university and uh, the citizens. Uh, in the communities living around the university, uh, which, is, which is an important aspect of responsible research uh, and innovation. But uh, young scientists moving towards uh, or trying to adopt openness of science can face several challenges. And our next speaker, Niharika Kaul, a young researcher at Priya, will share with us some of her uh, work and, and uh, thinking around uh, how can scientists uh, navigate these challenges? Uh, how can they find uh, resonance and consonance between uh, their human rights as expressed in various recommendations and uh, the work that they want to do as young scientists and develop professionally? Niharika. Thank you, Sumitra, and uh, it's it's great to be with here, uh, here with all of you. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, just one second. Right. So um, just to give you all a context, uh, I'm Niharika Kaul, and uh, I work at Priya in Delhi. Um, and um, so my uh, you know, the, the context of this is that we have been working with, uh, as Dr. Adams uh, earlier mentioned, with the Ring project for a very long time. And um, a part uh, of, of our work recently involved uh, understanding um, the recommendation on science and scientific researchers, scientists and scientific researchers, um, from a human rights lens and um, understanding and deconstructing that. Um, so um, taking that forward, um, today I uh, just wanted to touch upon some of those um, um, you know, uh, dilemmas and challenges that young scientists uh, and scientific researchers face. Um, so um, to start with, just to say that uh, the recommendation on science and scientific researchers uh, speaks very strongly and highlights very strongly several um, rights uh, of, of scientists. And um, uh, amongst the core principles, um, one of the foundational principles which actually uh, is, is common and foundational is this idea that any scientific um, conduct is subject to universal human rights standards. And uh, that being foundational, there are several rights and dimensions that uh, the RSSR touches upon, including social security, dignity, and so on. But today, I have just, um, you know, given the theme and given um, the pandemic, uh, where some of these dimensions have been exacerbated and heightened, um, I thought I will touch upon two such themes. Um, first one being um, the freedom of expression, um, opinion, thought, conscience. and. Um, uh, so to start with, I'd just like to say that um, the, 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 the freedom of expression is something which is um, so integral to scientific research, as we all know, to scientific progress. And um, the right to question, uh, the right to, uh, to comment, and the right to critically analyze that is equally part of the scientific progress. 
and um, these values of honesty, integrity, um, and 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 the ability to withdraw and and uh, you know take take uh, stop working on something if one doesn't if the conscience doesn't permit is very integral to uh, scientific research and that is something that the RSSR focuses on and categorically states and. Um, However, during the pandemic, we have seen um, several examples of how, uh, you know, there are these challenges of freedom of expression faced in the scientific and science community. Um, for instance, across the world, um, according to a recent report, uh, since January 2020, governments in 24 countries um, actually enacted vague laws and took harsh uh, measures criminalizing um, alleged misinformation about COVID or other public health issues. Uh, we also saw the case of several doctors in countries who were punished um, for sharing information about uh, COVID-19. Um, and, um, you know, so so th these are some of the harsher measures that uh, some governments have taken uh, across the world. There, have, there are also softer ways of, um, or rather subtler ways of uh, curbing free speech expression or thought, um, including funding, uh, because uh, withdrawing funding can also also lead to um, scientific researchers not being able to carry forward their scientific research. So, given that some of these um, are uh, some of these challenges have been exacerbated during the pandemic, what is crucial is that um, promote promoting independent public funded models of research, um, shifting the approach amongst higher education institutions, publishing houses, and journals to the idea of sharing knowledge, which so many of our speakers have already discussed and uh, we will be discussing this further, this idea of sharing of knowledge um, and the public good. Uh, building the science ecosystem, uh, not only from the higher education space, but also from a lower, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the thing of uh, primary and secondary levels of education are equally important. Empowering ethics committees and independent monitoring and evaluation mechanisms are part of this, this uh, process of which are very important to access this freedom of expression um, for scientists and scientific researchers. Um, Connected to this actually is the right to um, equitable uh, education and employment, because uh, without freedom of expression, equitable education and employment also is, is not possible. And uh, that is where the RSSR also strongly um, emphasizes on this idea of uh, how um, access to education and employment is critical. And um, within that, sorry, Sumitra, I'm just going to take a minute uh, just to say, just to end by saying that um, um, there have been several challenges in India and, and in uh, the broader global south context, including the scientific pedagogy, um, the idea of language, the teacher training pro uh, problem, the, the skill demand mismatch, and several other such barriers which create problems for access to education and employment. And finally, um, building these bridges between skills and employability, building a more inclusive ecosystem within education and the workspace to stop discrimination based on several factors and using technology uh, to actually bridge these gaps is the need of the hour. So with that, I'm just going to conclude and um, hopefully we'll some discuss some of this uh, soon again. Thank you, Niharika. Interesting uh, ideas, which I hope young scientists can reflect upon and try and adopt uh, as they go about building their professional careers. Sharing of knowledge, of course, is a very important aspect that all our panelists have been emphasizing. We now move on to the next uh, part of our discussion, which is around practice and action learning. We have six speakers in this section. Uh, beginning with uh, Nicolette Jada, who's a manager at branding, communications, and public engagement at Indian India Alliance. Uh, she will uh, share with us her experience around public engagement in science in India. Uh, Nicolette? Thank you. Thank you, Sumitra. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, thank you and good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure for me to be in your company, and uh, I would also like to take the opportunity to mention that India Alliance not only funds research, but we do provide a lot of science communication workshops and outreach programs for our young scientists and a lot more audiences who are interested in taking their work to um, the public in general. 
and this all happens for free. So I am glad to be a part of an organization where we believe that knowledge is power and we are willing to help you take your knowledge to society. So with this in mind, I will go directly to the public engagement part where I will uh, focus on uh, the last survey that we did conduct with a very small sample audience that was our fellows um, from November 2020 to April 2021. We did uh, reach around uh, 243 uh, Indian researchers and we did ask them about, you know, the experience about uh, public engagement and about their, uh, you know, taking their science to, to the public. And uh, the, the findings were interesting because they felt like uh, public engagement was not really a key factor in their research in terms of, uh, you know, even disseminating that information to the public. They felt it was not an inbuilt culture, it was not a mindset of, of our system. So what we try to do is that we try to with that in mind, we try to reach um, we try to reach the students in time for their uh, you know when we can inculcate, we can partake, we can actually give information as to how they make their science research uh, easy for anybody to understand. And with that research in mind, we go ahead and uh, you know we talk about the challenges that we normally face as a science communicator. You know we try to we try to find mediums of uh, you know enhancing our uh, fellows work with the audience and it's not only our fellows that we target you know and their research we also target other science other people who are interested in bringing their research uh, to the audience to the public in general now uh, uh, with the above in mind as i mentioned public engagement is one of the most would be is the most important uh, medium to kind of uh, of course the medium that you choose platforms that you choose have to be effective enough. And with that in mind, we always look at collaborating with the right partners. Through this year, India Alliance has looked at uh, collaborating with UCL London, um, IAVI, as well as um, India COVID SOS, where we kind of reached a various kind, we, we reached a lot of uh, community-based audiences that needed the information that uh, that they required to make uh, sound decisions in terms of health. We looked at uh, sectors of mental health, we looked at maternal and child health, we looked at COVID-19 as something that, you know, where we had to we had to convert people into, into understanding why is there a vaccination in the market, why is there a need for a vaccine? Because it was, I, everybody was was in two minds. So there were platforms that we created where we could have, where we reached the NGOs, we reached the media, we reached the government, and we brought out all these factors and made them understand the need of having such things in place. Apart from this is, uh, we do have the ISMF, that is the fellowship, one of the fellowships of uh, India Alliance that focuses on India Science Media Fellowship, uh, where we aim at uh, nurturing journalists from India to appreciate the scientific processes and tell stories and write about science, you know, that will reach the audience in gender. Apart from here is, apart from, you know, having to talk about the outreaches, the public engagement and, you know, getting media involved as well as the platforms, my point here is basically that we have to make science and public stand together because it builds a much needed conversation between science, ex the scientists, the experts and the audience. And this makes way to a knowledgeable decision in health and wellness for anyone and for their environment. So with that in mind, India, takes, India Alliance takes pride in funding public engagement activities related to research as well as science in general. And we keep this as an open invitation to all who want to connect to the masses and engage them in groundbreaking work. Uh, so this concludes my talk, but I will share a few links in the chat box for you to refer to, uh, where you will have a glimpse of our survey that we conducted, as well as the social media net, uh, platforms that you can uh, connect with us and know more about our work. So thank you for this opportunity once again. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolette. Uh, very interesting to hear about the efforts being made, particularly in these in COVID times. Uh, to uh, share uh, information and uh, generate awareness, um, you know, with reference even to the scientific temper, which an earlier panelist was speaking about. 
uh, platforms for communication are important for sharing knowledge. And that is the topic which our next speaker, Dr. Mamita Kole, uh, will be uh, sharing with us on building a digital platform for open science publishing in India. Dr. Kole is an STI policy researcher at the Indian Institute of Science in Bengaluru. Uh, Mamita? Yeah. Thanks, Sumitra. So uh, I will share my screen in case uh, the slides are moving. Please make me aware. Uh, so, okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Priya and Dr. Pandan for giving me this opportunity to share uh, this particular project that we have started at our center at the CCPR IC Bangalore. So, uh, Actually, I mean, so far in this whole conversation, we have heard a lot about that there needs to be openness and knowledge sharing. And this is something in India we are discussing from long. However, in that discussion, the focus is more towards access. As Dr. Dukta also uh, already mentioned that we are talking about this One Nation, One Subscription plan where we want to give access to uh, give access of the research articles produced throughout the world, not to few premier institution, which is the current status, but to a much larger audience. So that every, so that can help not only just help the researchers of smaller institution and colleges to build their research, up, but to even build a much larger scientific temperament among, among the citizen of the country. But if we look into this issue, then in India, the issue of this knowledge creation or dissemination is not just about access. There is even more broader challenges of equity and which has not been included into this OMOS proposal. So let me first tell, me, tell you all that what is this problem of equity? So the number one problem that actually all of the, especially the younger researchers will always agree that they face this gatekeeping tendency of the editors of this global Northwest uh, journals. It as if that there are certain barriers always exist, there is certain mistrust, distrust there. Then of course the lo local context specific research never gets attention or even approval. It's not just a problem of India, it's a problem of the global South as a whole. And then of course, the another evil that came up that this new APC based gold open access publication. I mean, it of course good for those countries who can afford it, but for Indian researchers, this APC are way above there. They cannot afford it. All the funding are, from the funding agencies, this would this has not been approved, and the amount is too high for no, even for the premier institution researchers as well. So under this backdrop, what can we do? So this is our proposal that India should build its open access digital publishing platform, and how and of course it's from the Indian funding agency that needs to support this, and how it will help this ecosystem is that of course the researchers of India will be able to publish their research into an open access publishing platform without any APC that's that to be given from their pocket. And definitely there has to be a very strict quality control. That's, that's the underlying thing that we are not denying at all. And once this platform is established, this will be open access. So not only just for the India, anyone from the world can will be able to access this research without have to pay any subscription cost. Uh, there is another problem in India, which is this predatory journal publishing industry, which is creating a very bad name for our country's science ecosystem. And we believe that this kind of infrastructure will, will really be able to counter this predatory publishing. And I already mentioned the gatekeeping tendencies or the local context specific research that doesn't get importance, then definitely this platform will uh, be able to do this in detail. In, in much broader way to serve the Indian science ecosystem. About this evaluation, I will come back to later. Now, how do we envision this uh, workflow is that definitely the main goal for us here is to utilize the technology so that most of the whole publishing process can be more and more automated, less human interventions can be needed. We can even use, utilize the technology like blockchain here so that 
the authors get a very smooth submission to the end to end and, and publishing end to end support. Editors also, editor and the editorial team also uh, would get a lot of technological support so that they can do their job much more faster. And there can be many inbuilt, built other, like automated review finders and everything. And one more thing that we think that it will be very important to explore is open, open peer review or such kind of tools which will enhance the quality and the transparency of the whole system. Now, I already talked that this platform can actually be very useful in research evaluation because in our new draft policy also looked into that. Let's not judge the research just based on some impact factor or number of papers. So we need new uh, evaluation criteria and new matrices. So once such kind of uh, matrices has been in figured out by the funding agency, then we can compute such things through this digital publishing platform. We will have all the underlying technology to, to do this. Um, now, how we can build this platform? So of course, it's not something very new idea. It's already been there. So Gates Research Foundation, well, Welcome Trust already have their own publishing platform. And then of course, uh, this March, 2021, Open Research Europe started, which is from the European Commission. And it aims to get this Horizon 2020 funding projects in through disseminated through this platform. Of course, it's not mandated, but it's favorable. But however, uh, they have given this outsourced the jobs to F1000 research, which is very recently acquired by the Stellar and Farm Francis, another uh, commercial publisher. And of course, this technology, what F1000 research uses, are proprietary. What we are proposing is that let us start from already known open source technology like OJS, developed around it. There are uh, that we can build many add-ons which would be necessary. It's like it's already it has been mentioned that when we transferred from to the from the print to digital, it was just like that. It's just become PDF. But all the necessary advantages of digital technology has not been translated, and we want that to be included into the platform. And I must mention here is that Indian. Uh, journal system is already, there is already a strong journal system, but funded by the academy of science academies. So they can be come into this platform to help this whole system. And another very important thing that probably many people are not aware of it, that most of the back end work of let's say LCVR, Wiley or Springer Nature, everything has been outsourced into India. So there is a very strong local publishing industry. So we can take their help uh, into many aspects of the, in running of this platform. So yeah, we are in very, uh, very early stage of this. We are just in the discussion mode, but for more details, you can visit our, visit our website or ask me question. Thank you. And we are looking forward for any collaboration or any any ideas that can come. Thank you. Thank you, Momita, for sh sharing this uh, initiative to make uh, scientific resources available uh, to a larger audience at a more reasonable, uh, you know, price. Uh, and we hope community knowledge can also find a space on this platform so that there is a connection between community knowledge and scientific knowledge. You mentioned the question of equity and uh, there, is, there are also ethical issues. And our next speaker, Dr. Bhavani Rao, director of Amachi Labs of Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peetam, will be sharing with us her experiences and suggestions on how ethical issues and community protocols can be incorporated into open science uh, discussions. Dr. Rao. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I was sent the, the agenda and the topics, right? So I was looked, at, looked at it and it had these two little questions underneath. One was, uh, can ethics be teachable? And then how does it play itself out in community engagement? Um, and then I listened to all the lectures that uh, wonderful uh, talks that were given by everyone. And almost everything, I mean, so much has been covered by the previous speakers. And I thought, okay, let me try and put one little knowledge I have on this in a, in a way that young scientists can actually remember. 
So I use mnemonics all the time to help me remember things. So what I'm going to offer you is some way of just kind of remembering some of the basic tenets that we have to all talked about. Um, just keep it in mind. And the other thing was that there was a constant uh, mention of uh, indigenous knowledge. We have a wealth of indigenous knowledge in India. So I'm going to go back to some of our indigenous knowledge and use that uh, as a way for us to remember what, what it means uh, to have ethics in our pursuit of knowledge and, and intersperse it with some anecdotes on what it, how we kind of learn the same lessons uh, through our community engagement, if, if I may. So, yeah, so the word ethics itself is, is, is intrinsically, of, it is rooted in values. Can it be learned? Of course, I mean, uh, do we evolve as human beings? Uh, do we have the capacity for change and transformation? Can a thief become a saint? Yes, I mean, it's a no-brainer. And that's why we're even having this particular program is because we believe that uh, ethics is something that can be learned. So, so that out of the way. So like I said, I would like to draw on some of our indigenous knowledge just as a way of actually thinking about ethics, especially when we're talking about a, a community-based uh, approaches and we're working with communities. I think one of the very often repeated um, word in this conversation is specific tree. Uh, second is uh, for the good of all, for the benefit of all. These are like repeated ideas and concepts that come. So I'm trying, going to try and synthesize these things into um, a way to remember. So I'm going to draw upon a very ancient text from uh, India. It's called the Lalita Sahasranama. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a 1,000 verses in the praise, praise of the great goddess. And one of the, the, I would call them almost like an aphorism that is in that uh, literature is this verse that says, "Om Icha Shakti, Jnana Shakti, Kriya Shakti, Swarupinya Namaha." It means salutations to the one who is the power behind intention, behind knowledge, and behind action. And I'm going to take this almost like an aphorism to basically synthesize almost all the concepts that we've been talking about but just put it under these three headings, just an easy way for us to remember. So we talk about intention, intention and motivation. What is the intention and motivation for us to do research, for us to sign, to, um, to in the pursuit of science? Of course, there is the, the need for uh, the truth, the pursuit of truth knowledge is, is basically um, a way that we're going to look at the, the essence of truth. And then, more importantly than that, is it motivated by compassion. It's for the benefit of all, for the good of not just humanity, but the environment, as it was specifically mentioned by one of the previous speakers. So for the good of all. So it's, it's compassion for the benefit of all. This is our intention, not just the quest for truth. And how do you actually, um, how do you actually implement that is, of course, definitely the method always becomes participatory. Intention is not only with you. The intention has to be also universal. That same intention that you have, like if you're going to do a particular research, it could be your intention, but it also has to become the community's intention, whichever community that you're working with. So there should be an alignment of intention between you and the community that you're working with. Um, simple example. The government of India built toilets all across the country. What happened to the toilets? A few years later, when you went, they were either they were used as storage bins or they were completely broken. Intention of the government was good. Yeah, so they built it, but the intention of the community was not there. And so the government's, the, whatever was done was basically um, wasted in its effort. So intention should be also aligned, not just your intention, also the intention of the community has to be aligned with you. Um, and again, speak, speaking very specifically of community engagement over here. Of course, and we know compassion can be dangerous if it's not accompanied by knowledge. So, um, I mean, we have so many stories for that, but, um, but just like we have the buy-in of the collective intention 
uh, that is needed for sustainability, we also have to have um, knowledge. Okay, I've written down some notes. Okay, so what kind of knowledge are we talking about? We're talking about knowledge that is based on research, hard factual sciences, hard hardcore facts, knowledge that is based on indigenous knowledge. What is the local knowledge? You may have knowledge of your own. You may have, I'm sorry, I already got a hand up. I've just started. I'm gonna go through it really fast. So you have the indigenous knowledge, the local knowledge, and then you have an empathetic understanding of what the needs of the people are. And you also have to draw out what are the needs of the people through participatory methods. So there's many levels and layers to the knowledge. And if you do not have a good understanding of all these many layered knowledge, you can again do things and you can have your research may not give you the kind of understanding that you have. And whatever you do uh, in the field, in the community may not have the effect that you desire. Third is action. And action is of course now mandated by ethics. You can't engage with the community without giving something back to the community. Oftentimes it's in terms of knowledge sharing, whatever you have, you give it back, or there's some kind of incentives that you build around it, but there is more to action than just that. But very important that your action is altruistic. You don't really expect anything from what you do. And this becomes very critical because unethical, Unethical practices often involve data manipulation because you have a preconceived notion of what you want to see. And this influences, now we really want to be ethical and size every lesson, whether it's uh, what you wanted to see or what you did not want to see, everything becomes a learning, but that's only because you're not attached to the results. The second you start having an agenda on that, then basically you are already starting from an unethical point of view. So if the intention is only compassion and search for truth, it automatically brings about this altruistic approach to action. Um, you can share the learning with the people and whatever you have learned, and this is open science and this thing, even more important, as important, I will not say even more important, is you build the capacity for them to understand and use the knowledge that you're creating. Yes, you're sharing it with the research community, you share it with the local community that you're working with. More than that, you build the capacity for them to really be able to use the knowledge that you have shared with them. So it's one step uh, to, I, I think, one more level that you can actually do ethics like, um, yes, I'm sorry, since I was over time, I few, have a few more points, but I think I'll stop there. But I think this kind of framework gives you a good idea of how to kind of bucket things. So you have to have the ethical approach in your intention, in the way you gather knowledge and where you share, and the way what you do with the knowledge. So in all these three aspects, you have to have the ethics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rao. I think the, the uh, intention and motivation to do research an action that is altruistic, that really speak to changing the culture. We began in the, right in the beginning, uh, one of the panelists spoke about changing the culture in which we actually do research and intention, motivation, action that is altruistic would certainly uh, be one of the, the ways in which to change that culture. Uh, I'm very, uh, I'm looking at the time and we have two more speakers. Uh, our next speaker is um, Dr. Nimita Pandey uh, from the Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru, who will speak to us about gender inclusion in our science policy and what young scientists will be able to do to practice uh, gender inclusion in their research. Nimita. Thank you so much, Sumitra. And uh, first of all, I'll take this opportunity to thank Dr. Tandon, Niharika, and the team of Priya for organizing such a relevant and timely discussion, I would say. And uh, okay, I, I'll be short when I come to the topic straight away, because uh, I believe equity and inclusion in STI policy is to be seen as a foundational element. However, we, we cannot limit it to gender, particularly when we are looking at gender per se. So we need to see the socio-cultural, geographical, and economic diversity existing in the country. 
of course, at regional and global level, the idea of inclusion has been brought on with, the, with how we harness STI for realizing SDGs. And uh, we, I think we all have been discussing such kind of debates and discussion in the global arena. Uh, but I believe gender inclusion is very important because the experience drawn from inclusion of gender can help us to understand what changes are required, particularly in structures, processes, and institutional culture to put equity and inclusion, say, at the core of STI policy. So uh, an STI and gender inclusion has been interlinked with scientific productivity, innovation, and economic development, but I'll not go into the depth of all these discussions. Also, as rightly pointed by many of the speakers who have already spoken about the right to do science and the access to science, it is very much interwoven with the idea of, say, gender equity and inclusion. In Indian context, uh, historically speaking, the idea of gender equity has not been given much attention. If you look at the previous documents, it is uh, there or not there or may not be implemented at all. So, uh, however, um, there has been effort at different institutional level in the government and non-government sector to take forward uh, the idea of gender inclusion. I would specifically talk about the forthcoming STI policy of India, uh, which somehow envisages to bring a paradigm shift by bringing gender inclusion to the core of scientific science policy. So though the idea of uh, gender equity is confined to one of the chapters, which is on equity and inclusion, the idea is all encompassing in different aspects, be it open science, be it entrepreneurship, be it scientific engagement, uh, to name a few. In particular, when we were looking at gender inclusion, uh, we looked at three different dimensions in STI policy. The first being mainstreaming the idea of inclusion. There, the idea was to see that equity inclusion in gender should be added as a subtext to all STI policies and processes, whether they are existing or upcoming. This opens up a very interesting debate that can we see STI policy in a silo? And I would say no. There has to be interlinked with mainstreaming gender equity with other policies, be it health, agriculture, be it uh, education. And hence, we need to revisit the aspects of affirmative action. This is what I believe that it's very important when we are looking at mainstreaming gender e inclusion. The second element is to look at institutionalizing equity and inclusion. In aspect of gender, it's important that we tend to develop an India-centric. I mean, there, there are wonderful models across the globe, be it the Ethanas One model or the Advance uh, program. It's important that we develop an India-centric uh, equity and inclusion charter where gender stands as a very important element. Uh, because uh, in order to understand the existing exclusions and inequities related to gender, in STI and whether it's in policy or in practice. It's very heartening and I would like to put across that DST brought this new program on GATI, which is Gender Advancement for Transforming Innovation, uh, Transforming Institutions, sorry for that. It's a pilot uh, project and uh, it is more about giving a cognitive trust to institutions to bring in gender equity if one has to draw an analogy, it is inspired by the Ethna Swan model, which exists in the UK. So uh, uh, DST is working very closely with the British Council and the Ethna Swan, uh, you know, the advanced HE in UK uh, to build up this model. And it's in the pilot phase. And we would be very happy to discuss at a, some other platform uh, about the details of this project. The third element is to assess equity and inclusion, and particularly with respect to gender, because be it dropouts, be it the element of what people talk about, gender intersectionality, caste, ableism, age, all these aspects, for policy per se, we cannot go on assumptions or intuitions. 
we need evidence we need evidence based and evidence informed policy hence it's important to develop framework databases instruments indicators and unfortunately in india we don't have that so it's important that we we need to understand uh, equity and inclusion specific issues there should be more studies done in this different kinds of models and frameworks should be replicated in such studies in order to develop and provide evidence for sti policies and practices i will quickly touch upon the point which was raised about young scientists and how they can take up uh, this i think it has to be done in a very bidirectional way and where i would say the idea of multi stakeholder participation also comes into being uh, one being of course uh, at an institutional level there has to be more inclusive processes be it process of recruitment retention promotion or for young girls when we talk about admissions of uh, in the science education access to resources infrastructure knowledge is also like what we talk about open sciences i'll just wrap up in maybe 30 seconds if, if that works for metro for you and uh, i think the idea of role model mentor and uh, mentorship and networking is very important but when i talked about stakeholder it's very important that we need to build such platforms for engagement of stakeholders particularly civil societies because we cannot really realize the last mile connectivity without having civil societies on board so by this i i would end saying that it's important that we give greater voice and more choices to young scientists uh, particularly women uh, so that we ensure that they are able to pursue science and practice science thank you so much thank you namita that was a near mute for years when you say inclusion of uh, civil society building relationships with them is very important in uh, equity and inclusion uh, work that young scientists would be doing uh, uh, an aspect of inclusion one of our um, one of our visitors in the webinar has uh, you know has also raised the question of special efforts being made to demystify science for women particularly poor and illiterate women and that would that is also an you know an interesting aspect of uh, gender inclusion and gender equity but you also spoke of platforms building relationships with various stakeholders and that is uh, some of the experience of our next uh, panelist dr sara ikbal Uh, who is an independent consultant with the Foundation for Advancing Science and Technology and a strategic advisor for the India Science Festival, um, working to build a, a platform and engagement with various uh, stakeholders in building an ecosystem. Uh, Sarah, we would like to hear from you. Thank you, thank you, Sumitra. And uh, I have to say, I've been so engrossed in all the talks that I almost forgot that I'm also supposed to speak at this <laughs> session. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed uh, listening to everyone, and, and there's so much to absorb in process. I'm still doing that, and uh, and I don't think that I will be able to cover the entire scope of the theme that has been shared with me of building an STI ecosystem, uh, and also fast India is still kind of uh, developing its thinking around. Uh, this and a roadmap uh, uh, of of doing uh, this but i do want to share my reflections from the field on perhaps uh, what nimita ended her uh, talk with is are uh, the young people you know uh, who who are a very small but a very significant part of the sti ecosystem and we generally don't tend to give them uh, a lot uh, you know we, they don't have a platform or or they don't uh, get heard as often uh um as as uh, the more senior uh people so as someone who's received training in uh you know scientific research from foreign institutions and as someone who's currently in the space of public engagement with with and for science where i have developed and contributed to programs um uh, aimed at inspiring young people to pursue science in india i've i've lately felt a strange sense of discomfort and even disillusionment in carrying out this role and this is largely because i don't think we have managed to build systems and more importantly a, a culture that can inspire and nurture young scientific talent in our country 
So here I am, I am as a scientist and a science engagement practitioner telling a young person that they should pursue science, but I cannot, cannot guarantee you that, they, that you will enter a system where you will be able to learn, grow and thrive. So, you know, that, that just makes me feel extremely dishonest at, at, that, at that stage. So, of course, India has um, multiple very impressive funding and career development programs, and there are new institutions and new research infrastructure that is being built. Uh, but I think we have to ask ourselves if we have enabling and supportive culture and practices in the first place that can make uh, effective use of such resources and funding that you know we are putting together. So it's like building a car where you have created the dream of the car, but you haven't thought about the engine that will drive the car. And young people are that engine. We have to think about them and how to provide the fuel to help them drive that car. And I think that some, 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 is a point where we've, we are lost and I think we're not, or maybe we're purely giving a lip service to, to this aspect of building SDI ecosystem. And I'm also saying this because for years, uh, we've been hearing about how young research scholars in India have to wait uh, months on end and sometimes even years to get their uh, research fellowships or stipends. So when they opt out of science, it's not about them wanting to do science or participate in science, but it's a matter of basic survival. So, you know, altruism has no role to play in, in, in this. Uh, and, and, and to add to this, there is rampant scientific and ethical misconduct prevalent in institutions of every shape and size and stature in the country today. And, and we're seeing a huge impact of that on young scholars and and their decision to stay in science. And, uh, and also because of this, many of them, obviously the more fortunate ones, uh, like, you know, like me, prefer to go to foreign universities to pursue scientific research. And you would see that these students, Indian students and researchers do so much better in these foreign institutions because they get a more supportive environment. Um, and, and then you have a student in India who compares themselves with their friends and peers in foreign institutions who are doing so well and sometimes wonder if they should even be in science, not realizing that uh, they did not in the first place get a fair shot at getting trained in doing high quality research in India. So I think young people not participating in science or for that matter brain drain is not really a developed country versus a developing country issue. It's because of an academic and research culture that is pushing young, talented people out of science. I think this is something that, uh, you know, we have to admit, recognize, and is a very critical part of the STI, uh, building the STI ecosystem. So, of course, there are many other factors that influence participation of young people in science, and I think we must uh, examine those very closely. And I think they're like, you know, you have science shops for citizens to share their concerns. I think we need also these platforms where young people can, uh, on, and young scientists can actually uh, talk about, uh, you know, their obstacles and challenges uh, in, in building their careers in science. And at the same time, we also have to examine if the scientific ecosystem gives a fair chance to everyone to pursue science, irrespective of their social, cultural, economic realities, or does it like others, every other system in our country favors the already advantaged groups? And, and we know that who, um, you, know, and, you know, we know that who gets to be in science or be part of science is greatly dependent on who is setting the agenda for science. So who's at the decision making table? And we need more diversity at that table. And so the solution we want to build and pursue is not more women in science or more of this group in science, but focus on creating an ecosystem system that would let anyone pursue a career in science and, and not just an ecosystem for conducting scientific research. I think that's what we are trying to do uh, now. And Niharika also you know, touched upon uh, these aspects of you know, right and access to equitable education and employment. So, yeah. And so, so, so you know, having said all of this, I, I do recognize we do need to set up uh, world-class upstream mechanisms and state-of-the-art yeah. infrastructure. So, um, yeah, so I was just saying that, you know, we, we need to set up, uh, definitely set up world-class uh, mechanisms and state-of-the-art infrastructure for scientific research and innovation. But at the same time, we should not lose sight of how we are nurturing and supporting young scientists uh, in India. So they do have a fair chance of thriving in this ecosystem and contributing to society. Uh, and participating in debates uh, in science that uh, you know have an impact on society. 
And so, um, we, we, you know, we really need to just look, relook, and maybe reimagine at how we are building capacity and STI in our country, and also ensure it is not isolated or disconnected uh, from the realities of our country, and of course, the you know the larger world we decided. So that's all from me. Thanks, uh, Sumitra. Uh, thank you, uh, Sarah. Uh, very interesting analogy of this is a car. Uh, we need to put in uh, the engine and sufficient fuel. Uh, I My eye is on the time and we are almost out of time. There's been interesting discussion happening in the chat. Uh, but uh, given the interests of time, I would now invite uh, Dr. Tandon to uh, give us his key takeaways from today's interesting discussion. Thank you, uh, Sumitra. Thank you very much. Uh, I am, in fact, uh, quite stimulated by the conversation over a couple of hours. And uh, I must say that a whole lot of you are very young scientists, and that too, at least from the Indian cohort uh, in this panel, uh, women. So I'm, 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 I'm very positively inclined towards the future uh, in this uh, context. You know, uh, this is a country where, uh, as someone mentioned, scientific temper is in our constitution. And a country where people's science movements have been around for centuries. But uh, somewhere along the line, when we started adopting science in its more institutionalized, more formal, more modernistic, if I may add, more European sense, then uh, we forgot a little bit of the old norms and old premises, some of which uh, I thought Dr. Bhavani was trying to remind us too. Uh, I like the way Dr. Gupta was in his comment this evening when he said that the purpose of science is to contribute to further democratization of society. And democratizing knowledge requires respecting various forms of knowledge produced not just in, inside the scientific lab or in academia, but more generally within the society. I always have a very interesting uh, you know, uh, experience during the pandemic. Uh, it is during the pandemic that we rediscovered that organic food production was known to our farmers. Why we rediscovered? Because the supply line was broken. <laughs> no, no fertilizer, no there's no pesticide. People knew how to produce food and therefore they survived. Likewise, home remedies of all sorts, from grandmothers downward, were available at home to deal with questions of building immunity or coping with any discomfort that the virus may be producing. None of this was practiced in against the more modern system of science. But historically, in countries like ours, modern system of science in its arrival and expansion devalued, displaced, and almost demonized local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, experiential knowledge. So participatory research starts with this recognition that people have knowledge arising out of experience. It does not mean that their knowledge is complete or adequate, but that experts can add to that knowledge in order to produce solutions which are workable. And universal solutions uh, do not work anywhere because every context and given the diversity of India produces its own logic. So what you need is universal principles which are then contextually applied. And when they are contextually applied, they build on local knowledge, local context. So a lot of today's conversation about open science therefore has been how do we encourage the new generation of scientists to develop a broader perspective about knowledge, knowledge production and utilization, and linking science to the very heart of society. As Jeffrey said, 
Indian International Science Council believes that science is a public good, common public good, collective public good. Obviously, it will come in conflict with patenting of knowledge. So, knowledge economy then trends should displace this perception or this logic that science is for common public good. And I think our young scientists need to be exposed to these conversations, not just from the point of view of rejecting knowledge economy or application of knowledge for economic development, but to acknowledge that there are other ways in which public use of knowledge can be expanded. And this is where, you know, science shop model that uh, Hank described has been around more than 40 years. And this, this provides a mechanism to a university or research institution to have an interface with society. So society can engage in posing research questions and research institutions and academia can explore how to generate answers. So I think that it is, it is wonderful that we are having this conversation today for three reasons for me. First of all, that UNESCO has approved open science recommendations and all the 193 member countries have acknowledged it, ratified it. Secondly, the new draft of science, technology, innovation policy in India has already begun to include a number of principles in the open science framework that has been there. And thirdly, that we are at the particular junction where we need to find a way to make knowledge work for all. Because if knowledge systems don't work for all, then democracy won't work for all. And control over the minds of people through a parochial use of knowledge is neither good for democracy nor good for science. Science does not flourish in those situations either. So there, it is not just a question of public. I think scientific institutions and for young scientists should be open to the idea of public accountability. Not only the research that they do, accountability of that, as has been mentioned by Andrew and others, but also accountability of the project of science carried out, which to sometimes create solutions which are not considerate of the larger ecosystem, ecology and environment we are in. The final point I want to make is that no change happens without some pressure. No change happens. Change does not happen from the top alone. If that was the case, all change would have happened by now. Change does not happen from the bottom alone. You need pressure from all sides. And culture does not change till some members in that institution begin to behave differently. Culture is not something that is written in policies. Policies are always wonderful. Practice is always lagging behind. So my appeal to you all, uh, young scientists, is and that there are many people around in the country and beyond who are willing to work with India's young scientists, not only for them to learn open science, but to bring about a change in the culture of science and scientific institutions, which not only helps you, but helps the society at large. Because gender mainstreaming, as Nimita said, is not just for science. Gender mainstreaming is for society at large. And there are feminist movements in the country which may not have infiltrated the scientific enterprise as yet, but that is what multidisciplinarity is all about. Don't look at disciplines within the academe, look at disciplines beyond. So thank you all for getting me excited about this. And I hope we can work together in taking forward an opportunity for young scientists of this country and many other global South countries, including in our neighborhood, in South Asia and Southeast Asia, such that their capacity to produce knowledge for larger public good could be reinforced and strengthened. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tandon, for those very wise words as usual. Uh, thank you to all our panelists and our participants who attended the webinar. Uh, special thank you to our partners, DBT India Alliance and the DST CPR Department of the Indian Institute of Science. Thank you for partnering with us for this webinar.
uh, several other webinars under Priya at 40, and we hope to see you there. Thank you, everyone, for a very interesting discussion. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank bye. You.